one of the longest confrontations in British history, the Malayan emergency was fought for 12 years between the colonial powers and communist insurgents following the retreat of the Japanese after World War II. And while it proved to be one of the few successful counterinsurgency campaigns fought by a Western power during the Cold War, it also resulted in being one of the costliest and perhaps the most controversial in terms of human rights violations. Using a mixture of concentration camps, saturation bombing, chemical warfare, and merciless headhunting, British and Commonwealth troops were allowed no restraint in their tactics when it came to overcoming the communist factions, with many comparing the actions of the colonial forces during the Malayan emergency to the later Vietnam War of the 1960s. British Malaya, which incorporated various states across the Malayan Peninsula and the island of Singapore, comprised a variety of nations brought under the control of the colonial government during the 19th century, primarily following the removal of Dutch settlers as an outcome of the Napoleonic Wars. From a largely undeveloped colony upon the start of British rule in the mid-1800s, by the turn of the new century, UK industries had turned the Malayan colonies into among the most prosperous economies in the world, thanks primarily to the export of tin and rubber to serve the wider British Empire. Unemployment was extremely low, and the capital generated from the export of raw sap from rubber trees, together with huge supplies of mined tin, meant the nation could easily weather the storm of the 1929 Wall Street crash and remain a powerhouse of Southeast Asia right up until the start of World War II. In 1942, the Japanese, as part of their widespread campaign to occupy large swathes of Asia, marched on British Malaya, resulting in their victory after only 54 days of fighting, this humiliating defeat sending the British into retreat towards India, while the Malayan population would suffer heavily at the hands of their new occupiers. Although there had been movements against British colonial rule prior to the war, most of which had been banned under UK law, once the Japanese had seized control of Malaya, communist factions began to take up an armed resistance against their occupation, leading to a vicious guerrilla war fought in both the cities and the dense tropical rainforest of the fragmented country. Thus, with communist forces working to unseat the Japanese, the British formed an unlikely alliance with the guerrilla fighters through the dispatch of British army officers to their jungle hideouts during 1943, with the leader of the Malayan rebels being the mysterious Sino-Vietnamese dissident Lai Tech, Director General of the Communist Party. Comprising up to 10,000 fighters, of whom the majority were exiled Chinese, displaced by the 1937 Second Sino-Japanese War, the British supplied the communists with weapons, under the condition that these arms be handed back to the British once the Japanese invaders had been defeated, though the natural outcome was that Lai Tech and his followers simply stored the weapons in secret caches deep in the jungle. Eventually, in 1945, the Japanese were defeated, and Malaya returned to the control of the British government, though the economic miracle that had been performed over the past century had been completely undone, and with the rubber and tin industries essentially non-functional, unemployment was rife among the Malayan people. Peace in Malaya, though, would be very short-lived, as aside from the communists refusing to hand back all their weapons to the colonists, 1946 saw rumours circulating that Light Tech was in fact a spy for the French and the British, working to forestall the revolution in Malaya, but before he could be fully investigated, Tech escaped to Singapore with the bulk of the funding of the Communist Party. Light Tech would remain on the run into 1947, later travelling to Hong Kong and then back to Bangkok in Thailand, before eventually being strangled to death by assassins from the Thai Communist Party during the same year. Chin Peng, Tech's 22-year-old second-in-command, ultimately took control of the Malayan Communist Party, or MCP, upon the previous leader's escape to Singapore, and had received an OBE from the British authorities for his successful guerrilla campaign against the Japanese during World War II. Unfortunately, this accord couldn't last, as Peng's communist dissidents remained the natural enemy of British rule in Malaya, something Tech and later Peng had been preparing for since as early as 1942. The strategy of the MCP was to capture as much of Malaya as possible from the Japanese during wartime, and then continue to occupy it before the British could re-establish their government. Between 1945 and 1947, heavy investment from the British had resulted in a near-full restoration of the rubber and tin businesses in Malaya, with productivity now back to pre-war levels, 
thus meaning the economic miracle of the country could be repeated, and was now generating profits that far exceeded all other colonies of the British Empire. Unfortunately, in order to maximise these profits, wages were but a fraction of what they had been prior to World War II, while working conditions were exceptionally poor leading to bitter resentment among the local population towards the British leadership. Therefore, during 1947, the MCP began campaigning legally for self-determination, Peng being spurred on by the recent independence of India and was convinced that the newly elected Labour government of Clement Attlee would be more accommodating to the prospect of allowing Malaya their own freedom from British rule. This, however, failed to materialise, and thus with his legal appeals ignored, Peng orchestrated 300 strikes across the Malayan industry during 1947, leading to widespread civil unrest. In response, the British banned trade unions from operating in Malaya during April 1948, though Peng demanded that the strikes continue and threatened to shoot any worker who refused to support strike action organised by the MCP-backed trade unions. Though Peng's insurrection in Malaya was comparatively small, its actions were taken very seriously by the British authorities due to the ever-present fear of communism, with 1948 having seen international tensions between the Soviet Union and the Western Allies divide occupied Germany into two separate nations, while Mao Zedong of the Chinese Communist Party secured victory over the government of Chiang Kai-shek. At the time, communist parties in Burma, Indonesia, the Philippines and Vietnam were also gaining greater influence as the nations of Southeast Asia sought to throw off the colonial rule from European and American powers. With peaceful routes having been exhausted, Peng and the MCP took to the jungle and recovered their secret weapons caches from World War II, beginning their armed campaign on June 17, 1948, during what was known as the Sungai Siput Incident, where suspected MCP fighters murdered three British rubber tree planters, thus officially beginning the Malayan emergency. In response to the killings, the British declared a nationwide state of emergency two days later, three months ahead of what Peng had originally anticipated, meaning the full might of Britain's military force in Malaya was being brought down on what was then his fledgling armed division of the MCP, the Malayan National Liberation Army or MNLA, before it was fully prepared. Meanwhile, the British, with emergency powers enacted, could arrest and detain anyone they suspected of being either a communist sympathiser or being associated with the MCP, British intelligence being of the opinion that there was a real threat that Malayans would join the revolt en masse and thus overthrow colonial rule. In raids across the country, over 1,000 Malayans were arrested in the opening weeks of the emergency, and the sight of British troops storming the houses of activists both day and night became commonplace, the colonial government initially referring to the MCP as merely bandits and expected that they would be crushed quickly and easily. For Peng, the MCP and the MNLA, they had high hopes that it would be the British who would ultimately be defeated, looking back on their huge success in helping to unseat the Japanese occupation. To do this, Peng and his guerrilla fighters focused their attacks on the rubber plantations and tin mines so as to harm Britain's main economic generator in the colony, the damage caused by the murder of workers and the sabotage of equipment costing the lucrative colonial businesses heavily. However, while the insurrection in Malaya was essentially an undeclared war between the British and the MCP, it was officially referred to as an emergency for insurance purposes, as London-based insurers would not compensate the industrialists in Malaya for lost equipment and property due to clauses stating that these assets would not be covered in the event of war. From a military perspective, the term emergency also meant that colonial forces could bypass several Geneva Convention laws, as this did not accommodate for insurrections or uprisings in the same manner as formally declared wars. This, therefore, meant that British troops operating in the jungles could conduct themselves in whatever manner they saw fit if the situation called for it. One of the earliest examples of this lack of restraint was the Batang Kali massacre of December 1948, when members of the Scots Guards executed 24 unarmed men and boys on suspicion of being involved in attacks on a nearby rubber plantation, their bodies being dismembered and violently mutilated, while the village of Batang Kali was burned to the ground. In the aftermath of the massacre, the British government implemented a cover-up of the incident, though an investigation during the 1960s 
especially in the wake of similar events like the Mai Lai Massacre in Vietnam, saw the killings uncovered and led to a legal battle against the troops involved that ultimately saw no charges pressed. By 1950, the Malayan emergency had reached an essential stalemate, with approximately 2,000 soldiers lost on both sides, together with hundreds of civilian casualties. Therefore, the British adopted a new strategy to separate the guerrilla fighters from their support networks, namely the local population, who were providing them with food and shelter, the solution coming to pass as the Briggs Plan, so named for the then Director of Operations in Malaya, General Sir Harold Briggs. Under the Briggs Plan, this new policy focused mainly on the people that the local authorities referred to as the squatters, primarily displaced Chinese who had fled from the urban areas during the Japanese occupation, and thus saw 10% of the Malayan people be placed into concentration camps dubbed new villages. With the regular population of the jungle regions now forced into camps, the British considered that the only people to be found outside the urban or industrial areas were either MNLA fighters or the Chinese squatters that supported them, with colonial troops burning the empty villages in order to deprive them of shelter. At the same time, over 40,000 Chinese Malay refugees were deported back to communist China under amendments to the Malayan constitution, which banned them from gaining citizenship and thus made them illegal aliens. This heavy-handed approach by the British only served to distance the Malayan people, and recruitment for Peng's communist forces increased substantially, with women as well as men joining the guerrillas. At the same time, the Briggs plan was not as effective as hoped in preventing the communist guerrillas from being supplied by the people, with internees still able to dig holes under the barbed wire fences at the new villages to either escape or pass food through to the other side. To counter this, the encampments had their barbed wire fences increased from one layer to three, and then to five, before eventually seeing these fences electrified, though even this wasn't enough to stop the support network, with food being carried out of the camps in bags of manure. Finally, though, the Briggs plan began to show results, after more than one million Malayans had been placed into concentration camps, while at the same time, the outbreak of the Korean War meant demand for rubber and tin had skyrocketed in order to supply the forces of NATO, leading to huge profits for the colonial industries. In 1951, due to the ailing health of Sir Harold Briggs following his turn of duty in Malaya, which ultimately led to his death a year later at his home in Cyprus, Sir Gerald Templer was brought in to take over as Director of Operations, and would continue to oversee the implementation of the Briggs Plan. Templer's position as Director of Operations wouldn't last long though, as on October 6, 1951, the British High Commissioner to Malaya, Sir Henry Gurney, was inadvertently assassinated by MNLA fighters while travelling to a resort outside Kuala Lumpur, his Rolls-Royce Silver Wraith being riddled with machine gun fire that killed both Gurney and his chauffeur. The assassination of Gurney specifically had not been planned by Peng or the MNLA, with the ambush being a purely routine operation by the communist fighters that would have attacked any vehicle coming down the road, and they were only made aware of the High Commissioner's murder when news broke of the incident later that day. On January 22, 1952, Conservative Prime Minister Sir Winston Churchill appointed Sir Gerald Templer as British High Commissioner in Malaya. Templer proving to be a far more practical figure in the Malayan emergency, as he mixed both extreme violence against the communists with a policy that would endear the British to the general population. Being of the belief that fighting the communists was only 25% of the battle, while 75% of the battle was keeping the local population on side, he opted to have the formerly bare-bones concentration camps be turned into comfortable and secure housing, where families could live and work without feeling like prisoners. At the same time, in order to separate the Chinese supporters from Peng's communists, Templer, having noted that this side of the population had previously been barred from elections and denied citizenship, fought to ensure that a million Chinese refugees were allowed to be made Malayan citizens. However, Templer, for the 25% of the battle that was to be done against the MNLA itself, would employ only the most brutal tactics to destroy the fighters and demoralize their agents in the jungle endorsing the use of torture and summary execution as a means of instilling fear into the enemy. This treatment of the MCP and MNLA guerrillas led to some of the most notorious British actions regarding the mutilation of the dead for psychological purposes, 
including Royal Marine commandos taking the severed heads and hands of captured fighters for identification, while the headless corpses were left on display in the centre of towns and villages as a deterrent. The beheading and mutilation of MNLA fighters was done primarily by hired IBAN mercenaries from the colony of North Borneo, who employed their jungle tradition of headhunting and scalping their dead enemies, keeping skull fragments and other body parts as trophies. At the same time, the British in Malaya were the first employers of Agent Orange during jungle warfare, as supplied by Imperial Chemical Industries of Millbank, London, who provided the rubber plantations with the chemical as a herbicide. In military applications, Agent Orange was used to clear dense vegetation, and due to its effectiveness in killing all living organisms, both plant and animal, was the primary weapon to disperse any potential roadside ambushes by the MNLA. Additionally, the RAF, under Operation Fire Dog, used all manner of aircraft to destroy MNLA encampments and disperse their fighters into the jungle, with Avro Lincolns being used for the saturation bombing of large swathes of the rainforest as a means of driving the communists from their fortified positions. Meanwhile, Supermarine Spitfires and de Havilland Vampire Jets conducted low-altitude attacks on MNLA infantry in the open countryside, and the Westland Whirlwind helicopter was adopted to deploy troops deep into enemy territory, one of the first instances of helicopters being used in this occupation on such a scale. The British and Commonwealth forces thus vastly outnumbered the rapidly demoralised MNLA, with troops from Australia, New Zealand, Fiji, Kenya, Nyasaland, and northern and southern Rhodesia also being contributed to help destroy the communist factions. In addition, what had previously been clumsy sweeps by large numbers of British troops through the jungle were replaced by sections of platoons carrying out patrols and laying ambushes that were based on an extensive network of informers. A policy of collective punishment was also adopted on those villages deemed to have been aiding the MNLA guerrillas, including strict curfews, the closure of public services such as schools and bus operations, and the slashing of rice rations for up to 20,000 people that brought them to the brink of starvation. However, while the atrocities in Malaya against the MNLA were exposed and distributed widely across the British press, with images of decapitated fighters being spread over front pages, Templar justified his actions as the only way to truly suppress the communist threat in the country, knowing full well the severity of the situation and the only way to fully pacify it. Regardless, Templar would be vilified in the British press as a controversial figure, and was even dubbed the Tiger of Malaya, a name previously held by Japanese general Tomoyuki Yamashita, who had captured Singapore and Malaya during 1942 and had been executed in 1946 for his atrocities and crimes against humanity. Long term, however, Malaya was to be granted independence regardless as following the return of British colonial rule in 1945, after the defeat of the Japanese, the loose administration of British Malaya was finally consolidated with the formation of the Malayan Union on April 1, 1946. However, Singapore was not included in the Union, as it was considered a crown colony by itself, while reactions from the local population in Malaya to the creation of the Union were strongly critical, primarily due to loose citizenship requirements and the reduction in power of the Malay ruling class. The Union was thus replaced from January 31, 1948 by the Federation of Malaya, with Tunku Abdul Rahman spearheading a diplomatic route to independence on behalf of the Federation states, resulting in the gradual unity of the Malay, Indian and Chinese peoples to develop what was generally considered to be an unofficial single country. Thus, on February 8, 1956, the announcement was made that the states of the Malayan Federation would be granted independence, effective from August 31, 1957, the Federation, under its own self-governance, gradually moving towards the formal creation of a single country known as Malaysia from 1963, which included the British territories of Singapore, Sarawak and North Borneo. As for Peng's MCP and MNLA, with independence granted in 1957, their objective was now generally complete and fighting would end in 1958, followed by the newly established government declaring an end to the Malayan emergency in 1960. Chin Peng, though, had not finished his crusade for communism, and would reignite the MCP in war against the Malaysian government during 1968, under what was known as the Second Malayan Emergency, 
caused primarily by ethnic tensions between the Chinese and the local Malayan people. From his exile in Thailand, Peng would orchestrate his communist factions throughout the 1970s and into the 1980s, until eventually in December 1989, 21 years of fighting would come to an end with the signing of the peace agreement of Hat Yai, following the loss of the MCP's position of strength in the peninsular region, this deal being brokered by Thai authorities in collaboration with the Malaysian government. As an outcome of the Malayan emergency, 1,443 British and 1,346 Malayan troops, together with 39 Australians and 15 New Zealanders, would be killed in the conflict, against 6,710 of Peng's communist fighters, representing the highest casualty rate for a post-war British anti-insurgency campaign, while at the same time nearly 2,500 civilians would also be killed. In terms of comparisons to the Vietnam War, and as to how victory was achieved against the MNLA, while the Viet Cong were able to maintain a continued and successful guerrilla campaign right up until the American withdrawal, there were many differences in strategy and execution with regard to the Malayan emergency that allowed for a general control of the situation by the British authorities. The main differences were the fact that the MNLA never numbered more than 8,000 troops at a single time, while unlike the Viet Cong, who could seek refuge in friendly North Vietnam, China and Cambodia, as well as being supplied by these nations, the MNLA were restricted solely to Malaya, and thus were confined in their abilities to avoid the patrols of the British. On the side of the colonists, the British quickly established an extensive network of informers and intelligence that thoroughly infiltrated the ranks of the MNLA, while at the same time seeking to ensure that the Malayan people, even with their detainment in the new villages, were kept satisfied and not made to feel like internees, with many Malaysian civilians to this day still living in the furnished new village settlements established by the British back in the early 1950s. To summarise the British strategy, it was determined that simply deploying insurmountable firepower at the MNLA would have yielded nothing but wasted time and resources, and could have easily been avoided by the fighters, while a more precise low-intensity war conducted by a mixture of intelligence and autonomous platoons of highly trained commandos worked well in not only rooting out the insurgents, but also demoralising them through the controversial tactics endorsed by Sir Gerald Templer. Thus, under his tenure, the originally heavy-handed approach of the colonial troops, which was leading rapidly towards an unwinnable situation similar to the Irish War of Independence and the Aden Emergency, was reversed in favour of a campaign that worked to keep the civilian population as general allies, while at the same time successfully suppressing the rebels and rendering them largely ineffective through a hardline stance.